Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back for another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, and he's actually one of my mentors. I learned a lot about gold and silver miners and royalty companies from him. He's written uh, more than three books about silver, including the Silver Manifesto. He's also written a paid newsletter for decades covering gold miners, silver miners, and royalty companies. He's had many winners in there, a lot of small companies that turned into large companies, royalty companies, and gold and silver miners. David Morgan of The Morgan Report, thank you for joining me again. Well, Jason, it's uh, always a pleasure to be with you. I always learn something when you interview me. Uh, you definitely stay up on these markets, and uh, it's a real pre- pleasure to call you a friend. Thank you very much, first of all. <laughs> you didn't need to say that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Appreciate the kind words. We're recording this interview on Friday, August 16th, 2024. The gold price has held up really, really well lately, you know, in the past with a strong dollar and the Fed suggesting either raising interest rates or lowering interest rates, there would be paper price smashes of the gold price. The gold price is still above 2,500. It's at $2,507 right now. Silver has actually rallied a lot in the last week. I think it got to like $27.50 one point. I want to get your thoughts on the increase in marginal gold and silver demand. Do you think that there's like a paradigm shift since October of 2023 where this new marginal buyer from retail investors, what China, India, Japan, uh, Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, the Asian retail investor is now the new marginal buyer and they're going to start setting the price for gold and silver? I do. Um, I don't know how much to elaborate, but there has been a shift and it really came about as you you know indicated October, I mean, you know, looking at the chart, I got a year chart in front of me, and the twenty one, the two thousand level, was very important because these round numbers, especially a big number like that, uh, it has a psychological value to it. And so, silver, excuse me, gold <clears throat> took a while. October it was down into the about eighteen twenty seven according to my cursor here, and it wasn't there for very long. It popped back up, got up to 1900 made it up to, for all practical purposes, 2000, 1991, it looks like. And it stayed there from like the end of October till approximately the end of February. And it was back and forth. It was above 2000 below 2000 above 2000 below 2000 And once it broke through in March of this year, we shot up to about 2,400 rather rapid. And then we had a trading range, which we've been in for some time. And now we are at the $2,500 level. Coming back to your, your assertion, which is more an assertion, I believe it's a fact. The shift from west to east took place a long time ago, but not at the retail level at the international level, at the central bank level. I mean, China's been buying gold steadily for decades. Russia's been buying gold. Uh, A lot of the Asian countries here and there. But as far as the retail investor where the public said, hey, I want to buy gold. I'd rather own gold than real estate, for example. I'd rather own gold than stocks. Or I like stocks, but I want to hedge my bets with gold. This is fairly recent. Uh, I'll give it back to you on Japan, but before I give it back, uh, that's been the case in China recently. And a lot of the feedback I get, and I have friends that are Chinese that live in China, some that are Chinese that live in Canada and other places, but I get you know almost firsthand information, in some cases firsthand information, that the shift to move to gold, especially in China and Japan, uh, is really caught fire. I mean, this is, so to further what you stated, I do think that we've made a shift that's not really seen by a lot, even in the gold community, that who is setting the price and who's running the ship is, is, to, is turned to Asia. And I want to just add one more thing, and that is there's a guy on, um, on Twitter or X and he goes by the ghost. He doesn't speak English very well, but he writes it and understands it. And so I have a dialogue with him from time to time, written form. And I asked him about silver. And, and when I was in uh, China in 2008, 
Uh, you couldn't find silver on a retail level in Beijing. I, I didn't scour all of Beijing, but I did hit a few places. And you know, the only thing I could find for investment purposes were Chinese uh, were chopsticks made of silver. I might have mentioned that in our last interview. But now he said uh, that the, the demand for silver by retail investors in China is the greatest in 50 years. That's what he told me. Now, that's one source you could take it with a grain of salt, but I think it coincides with what we've already outlined, that the gold demand is definitely there. It's measurable, it's seen, and yet some of that is spilling over into the silver market. Do you think a lot of it is like hedging currency debasement? Because a, a lot of these Asian currencies, it might be as bad, if not worse, than the Asian tiger crisis from decades ago. It seems like a lot of these Asian currencies, especially the Japanese yen, the Korean won, there's rumors of a Chinese yuan devaluation soon for them to try to stimulate growth and bail out some of their banks. Do you think that the uh, Asian retail investor is hedging this, that they're worried about currency debasement uh, domestically? And the dollar, what the dollar is relatively strong against these Asian currencies. So it's like an inflation hedge in Asia more than in the U.S. In a word, yes. And I really can't add a lot to that other than the Japanese have kind of been in this financial repression for a very long time. And not knowing your culture very well, but studying it, reading about it, listening about it, I get, you know, I have, to have some sense of it. And they just basically, uh, like the old... English phrase, you know, the stiff upper lip, they just kind of grin and bear it and just go along with it. And it's for the greater good. And they just kind of put up with it. That's ended. Uh, so that's why I gave you a, a, a strong yes. I think now there's a financial survival mechanism. I mean, we talk about the survival instincts. I believe that's true for any living creature. But there's also like a financial survival instinct. And when you start worrying about what your dollar, your yen, your euro is going to be worth, if it's going to even purchase anything in the nearer term, six months, a year, two years out, people start to you know wake up and start to take, you know, kick in their survival instinct and financially protect themselves. And the greatest protection known to mankind for thousands of years has been the precious metals. Will crypto do it? Yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, will real estate do it? Mm, perhaps. But nothing is as liquid, transportable, easily recognized, or have the longevity that the precious metals have. And so this is, uh, I don't want to be dramatic too much, but it's been a, basically a new dawning. It's like, okay, I've gone along with your game. I've gone along to get along. It's for the greater good. But you know what? I want to survive, and therefore, I'm going to move some something into gold. Well, also with the Japanese yen against the dollar, I mean, this was one of the largest moves in currency exchange rates in many, many years. I think I, if I remember correctly, only a few years ago, the Japanese yen was at 100 Japanese yen to a dollar. And then at one point, didn't it get to almost 170 Japanese yen to the dollar? I mean, that's a huge move in the currency markets. Yeah, it was 160 something, might be 170. I won't split hairs with you. And I remember when I was very active trading, when the, the yen was 100 to one, definitely remember that. Um, so yeah, it is a huge move. And, you know, it's, I call it the banker's last vestige of hope, uh, because, you know, if they can make you think that a currency is, you know, superior to another one, I mean, it can be, I'm not saying the foreign exchange markets don't work and can't make money of them and they don't fluctuate. All that's true. But at the end of the day, if you look at the big, big picture, they're all pieces of paper that are intrinsic value of zero. It's not based on the amount of resources your country has. Oh, it's a, the Canadian dollar is great because they have so many natural resources. No, they don't back their currency with their natural resources. It's a function of who prints the fastest. And since the United States prints less aggressively than other countries, as bizarre as that sounds, it's a quote-unquote sounder currency because they don't print as fast percentage-wise as Argentina does or Zimbabwe or or many other countries. I outlined several of them in the in the Silver Manifesto. The point is they're all, as Jim Dines used to say, it's a race to the bottom. Whose currency can be worth absolute zero the fastest? And the idea being that the the cheaper you make your currency, the better of a import export advantage you have. Your goods are cheaper, so you can do more business. So let's make our currency worth less and, and get more bu business into our country. And it's a very sick and very 
in the long run, very bad system that basically wipes out a lot of labor, a lot of savings, and a lot of goodwill. And when people start to become enlightened, as you're outlining, Jason, they take action. And once that action started, it accelerates. I said this before, not on with your interview, I don't think, but the run to gold starts with a, a, a slow walk and then a full walk and then a brisk walk, then a light jog, a full jog, a fast jog, a mild run, a fast run, and an all-out sprint. And an all-out sprint, everybody's running as fast as they can to grab as much as they can out of the current asset base, stocks, bonds, real estate, equity, even some businesses, bonds into gold because it's the only thing they trust. Well, we're not there. I'd say we've gone from the slow walk to the walk with all the central banks buying gold hand over fist the last two years. They bought it at, according to the World Gold Council, at rates above the what's been gone on in the last 50 years. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. That's what they published. But the idea is, again, that not only has the gold market moved from west to east, but it's accelerating. And now it's going to accelerate further. And now we see verification with the Japanese and the Chinese. So I think we're in, you know, as the baseball analogy, probably the bottom of the seventh inning. And we've still got the eighth and the ninth to go till we go to that full out ongoing sprint. And that's when you want to reevaluate the gold price and say, well, is it worth selling or not? And of course, we're not there yet. So I don't know. To add to your point, Sarah, I think I think the sentiment is not super bullish for a lot of people. A lot of people are very skeptical about the move in the gold price. So the longer it stays above twenty four hundred, around twenty five hundred dollars an ounce, the more people are going to be buy into the move that the gold price is going to stay around these levels or potentially go higher. I, I think the non G seven central banks, what they've been dollar cost averaging pretty steadily at a higher pace since the Russia sanctions in twenty twenty two. But really, the um increase. That we've seen the big, big increase, I think, because the central bank demand has been pretty steady uh, for the last couple of years since the Russia sanctions in 2022. The big increase was the marginal increase for retail investors in Asia. Didn't the uh, gold, the silver premiums, David, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't they get up to like around $6 an ounce for uh, the Chinese bullion dealers and the Shanghai Gold Exchange at one point, like in October, November of last year in 2023? I mean, that was like insanely high. I'm not sure if I've ever seen premiums that high before for silver per ounce. They were in that range. I think six is correct. You can look it up, you know, get back to me and tell me I'm wrong, but I think it was in that range for sure. Yeah, it, the biggest basic arbitrage available, uh, but really it's tough because there's um, there's VATs and other costs that are involved. So to make the ARB worth it, uh, if you go through it legally, is really rather cumbersome and it's designed where you really can't do as much arbitrage as it looks like if you just look at the number are, are you talking However, like a retail investor or like a, a, can a bullion banker actually say like okay we're gonna withdraw as custodians we're gonna withdraw tonnage from the slv and we're gonna fly it to uh, beijing or shanghai and uh t capture those premiums you can't i mean you can, because once you pay the import duty and they make it par you've just done all that work for nothing so even the bullion bankers wouldn't get a tax break on that? Well, that I'm not sure of. I you know, never worked with the bullion bank. I've never been at a trading desk. Uh, so the, there's the possibility. What I do know is what the flows are, and they are rather substantial. So can they make it? I'm sure you know the banks work for themselves, as you well know. So can the banks do it? Yes. And I do know India especially, and, I, and I've been told by this uh, same gentleman I referenced earlier, that uh, you know, it's worth. It's wor some people think it's worth the risk to smuggle it in. In other words, you don't you circumvent customs. Now you got blocks of silver that you bought at you know six dollars lower, and you shipped it. Uh, now you've got a premium that you can capture. So whether it's done above board or below board, below board does happen. Not a lot because you've got a big risk, but above board probably. I really don't know. I know what I've read. I know what I've been told, and I know what Jeff Christian wrote from CPM, and he wrote it after I said it, which I was informed that you know there's a lot of strings attached, and you really don't get that big of a, a delta between, let's say, London and uh, Shanghai, even though on paper it looks that way. Uh, there was an Indian stewardess gold smuggling 
into India is super popular. I guess people still get arrested, but there's an Indian stewardess, an attractive one. There's like her mugshot. She's been arrested multiple times for smuggling uh, uh, large amounts of gold inside her body. It's kind of crazy, all the stuff she did. But um, I guess, like you said, the profit incentive. I want to ask you, though, about Chinese solar demand and Indian solar demand. The China, I, for our listeners out there in the last, I think, month or two, they just brought on online the world's largest solar farm or solar plant. I think it's near the Gobi Desert. You've written extensive books on silver. The Silver Manifesto covers Austrian school economics and industrial usage for silver. You also wrote your mini silver book, which only talks about all the silver industrial uses. That one's like, I'm not sure if it's still in print, but it was excellent. I read it many years ago. How long do these uh, solar panels last um, and how often do they have to be replaced? 20 years is a rule of thumb. Um maybe 25 on, you know, if they're in a good area and don't get much weather, you know, but uh that's about it. And unfortunately, you really can't recycle the silver very you cannot recycle it very easily. Can it be recycled? Not economical. I mean, there's no way to take it, you know, take them down, transport them in a truck, take them to a salvage area, you know, shred them with a big machine. Uh, then burn everything off that's plastic and not metal, and then sort it out and all that. You can't do it economically. Will you be able to do it by government edict where they demand that solar panels are recyclable? Yeah, that that could certainly happen. But um, it's really not that much silver in a solar panel. The new ones have more than the than the previous era. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this works out. I mean, you know, I, I'm very cognizant of this whole green situation i've been rather outspoken about it uh, uh i mean in the windmill situation the amount of and i love to think about energy return on energy invested so the amount of energy invested to make a windmill you never get back it's not even break even no matter how long that thing runs you're never going to get your energy back out of what you put in to make the darn thing. secondly i mean most people don't know you need a diesel engine to start them up uh, and they don't last nearly as long as their as their lifespan was purported to be. So the windmill thing is probably the worst of them. Solar is okay, and I can certainly see the use of it where, let's say, you're going to put a mine in on top of a mountain that's uh, you know 300 miles from the nearest uh, power line. Well, it makes sense to build your own power plant, and you can do it depending on where you are on the planet with solar panels and get going and do it quickly and do it actually fairly cost effectively because solar panels will become more and more efficient and less and less costly because of, uh, you know, how economics works. But I do think that um, it's, it's going to end up being a moot point because the amount of silver that's needed to, let's say, turn the United States into a solar only electrical grid takes basically two and a half mil billion ounces of silver. And that's probably all the silver above ground in investment form. And then some, and all you've done now is powered, you know, 5% of the world's population with solar. So how are you going to pop, you know, how are you going to power the world with solar? Unless there's a huge technological breakthrough, you can use copper or there's some other system where the efficiency goes from like 20% to hundred percent. Or ninety percent, uh, so I can't rule that out. But uh, the return on investment, energy-wise, on solar takes on my panels, which aren't the most efficient, fifteen-year payback. So in year sixteen, I'm actually getting paid back what I put into capital cost, transportation, insulation, labor, and the cost of the panels to break even. That's a pretty long wait period. And I don't see a lot of solar panels lasting those 20 years, as you said, especially ones that are near the Gobi Desert in China. I mean, those are harsh conditions. If a miner is installing them near a mountain, I mean, there could be heavy winds, any type of bad weather where it's not perfectly sunny, say in like Arizona or something like that, uh, where there's like forest fires or a lot of um, hailstones or heavy wind. I mean, that could break the solar panels a lot faster, wear them down much quicker than the 20 year time span. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of these solar panels on houses, Dave, around here. We get a lot of wind and rain around here, some snow. Those solar panels do not last a decade in most cases now. I've got, I don't remember where it was. It was a great big solar farm. I believe it was in Asia. I put on my Twitter account and I, and it was wiped out 
by re- a, a very bad se- severe storm. And boy, that's a lot of money when you get a you know so- solar is taking you know, hundreds of acres or whatever. It was a vastly large array, and uh, they're done. And boy, that's a lot of waste of energy, you know, to put those things together and then have all the labor to put them all together and that so many of them. And it's it's not, you know, like I said, I have them. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I mean, I have them on my current place and I've got them on the cabin and I don't need that many to run the cabin because it's off grid. It's some power, you know, run the laptop and the iPhone and wood heat and propane for cooking. Um, and it makes sense. I mean, this thing is miles from, uh, from the power grid, but nonetheless, uh, to go solar, uh, does not really make sense in most cases. It just doesn't. And as you said, you know, what's purportedly the lifespan and all that, there are factors that you got to take. You don't want to put a solar farm up in a, you know, hurricane alley. (laughs) It's stupid. Uh, unless you have them bolted so strongly, putting them on the rooftop depends where you are. But even there, you know, you, you really want to use your head. I mean, the way I have mine set up uh, here is um, a very stout mechanical system that is very, very protected. I wouldn't put it on the roof here because there's more likelihood of damage uh, from weather conditions or maybe blown off the roof does sell like it could happen, but it could that type of thing. So, you know, I don't want to drill down too far, but you did, you know, hit a bit of a nerve with me. I just want to be, um, well, you know, forth, I, forthright about, they do have their place, but they are not really a substitute. And even if they were, there's not enough silver to make it a substantial substitute. That's my point because most of these, Pro green people think that well the cost the same per kilowatt hour. Let's go solar. Well, it looks good on paper. But what they don't know is the energy used to make one, how long they last, and how much there's available. Yeah, there's research out there uh, that by 2025 or 2026, all of the annual silver supply could be used for industrial purposes. I'm not sure if it comes true or not, but there are projections for that. And then um, the new statistic that I just saw for India is that in the first almost six months of this year in 2024, India imported more silver than all of 2023. Were they using that silver to make solar panels and for industrial purposes like manufacturing electronics or was that investor demand? We reported on that in our private work. That's for the largest proposed solar farm in the world. It's the size of the city of Paris. That amount of land mass will be used with nothing but solar panels. Think about that. Okay, so that's like a government project. Is what a test facility, though? Or there, or is I don't like know if there- it's a test facility. I'd have to read my own work. It's been a few months since we reported on it, but yeah, it's the size of Paris, and it's a, the biggest solar farm proposed so far. And China has a large one too. That's that's interesting. I mean, also like Indian silver demand is also up a lot from, this is anecdotal, but one of my buddies who got married, who's Indian from uh, graduate school in the MBA program, he told me that for dowries that a lot of uh, Indian families have switched instead of all gold in the dowry, it's now like 50% silver and 50% gold for a marriage dowry. Very interesting. I just had that same discussion recently with uh, someone that's from India that I know quite well, very dear friend actually. And, uh, he didn't tell me that part. We, we discussed the gold side, but yeah, silver is more and more, you know, it's the most useful metal. I mean, we could go on and on. I'll, I'll send it back to you, Jason. You can ask me another question, but I really think that the demand side on silver, oh, let me come back to what you said. The Jerusalem Press wrote an article that said we could be out of silver in theory this next year in 2025. That is not true. But if you look at Matt Watson's projection, it's possible by 2030, which is only about five years away. And that's industrial side only. Well, as the, you know, this yen carry trade unravels or there's a currency devaluations or a currency crisis where currencies are competing against each other to stay alive, uh, we could get in a real mess where the rush to gold starts and the gold price gets so high that the average citizen is looking to buy silver because they can't afford gold. And I really think that the 1970s are going to be repeated here, where the um, general public gets a lesson in true monetary history, where they realize that the metals are the way you preserve your wealth. 
there's no other way to do it. There could be. I mean, I'm not anti-crypto. I'm involved with a couple. But um, overall, the time-tested way to go is to have precious metals as a backup. Well, we're also starting to see these other G7 central banks start to cut interest rates and add liquidity back. They're claiming that there's no inflation, that they've beat or tamed inflation. So in Europe, they're claiming that their own inflation is 1% or less. Here in the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank and the Bureau of Labor Statistics just claim that inflation dropped below 3%. I don't believe them, but like the financial professionals do, I think we're going to find out that inflation is going to come back, like you said, similar to the 1970s, where it came in waves. Exactly. It does ebb and flow. And of course, we can't trust the government. I mean, if you do, fine. But, uh, you know, first thing they did when they revamped the CPI was take out energy and food. I mean, how ridiculous is that? The two things that humans need the most, energy and food, are out of the equation. Give me a break. And then if you go to uh, shadowstats.com and look at John Williams' work where he calculates the CPI based on how it was in 1980, you'll find we're running about 8%. 8% is a large rate. And I'm old enough to remember when Nixon was in office, they put in wage and price controls when inflation hit 4%. And 4% scared them so badly that he implemented wage and price controls. Well, and look what they're he, talking about now with grocery, the those evil grocery stores, David. <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> yeah. we're gonna put price controls on those evil grocery stores, those price gouging grocery stores. Yeah. And a margin on a grocery store is pathetic. An average grocery store, I forget exactly, don't you know, quote me, I mean, but it's around 3%. It's nothing. Yeah, the gross it, margins are bad. They're 3% or less, unless it's Whole Foods, which is marking it up real high. But yeah, you're right. You're correct about the, the regular grocery stores like a Kroger or some of the others. You're, you're exactly correct. Anyway. Well, where would you like to go next? <clears throat> well, let, let's talk about gold and silver miners. So I want to get your thoughts on the earnings for the first quarter and second quarter this year for the gold miners. Do you think they're pretty good so far? Or do you think that like there's still a lot of cost uh, problems with a lot of the industry that they're struggling to keep costs under control and we're not going to see the free cash flow that uh, a lot of people are expecting going forward? That's a tough one. I mean, there's always exceptions. So we wrote an article. <clears throat> Actually, Chris wrote it for me. Uh, he asked me and we kind of combined heads, but he did most of the work. And we outlined during the high inflationary times what's the best. And, of course, people think, well, gold, I'm going to leverage the gold miners. But we pointed out that you really want to be in the royalty companies because you're pretty much protected from the inflationary environment if you own a royalty company. And I'll stand by that as, as a blanket statement. On top of that, you look at you know some of your stalwarts that really aren't getting to the bottom line, what you expect. And we really haven't factored in the oil price yet because oil has been actually rather tamed so far, and yet it could explode, especially what's going on in the Middle East currently. Even if things calm down in the Middle East and we have you know peace, uh, I'm still a believer in the peak oil uh, analysis. The thing that's kept oil prices um, where they are is a few. One is, of course, the illness that curtailed a great deal of trade. And basically contracted the economy and <clears throat> the idea of this fracking, which works in the short term, but it works only in the short term. And so it's a red queen situation where the you got to run faster and faster just to stay in place. The depletion on a normal fracking well is something around three years. You lose something like 70 percent. That's a rule of thumb. They vary, but that's a general idea. So you got to keep fracking more and more and more to just keep the flow rate where you need it to be. And yeah, it's been a boon. It's been good. It's kept the energy costs down, but it's not what it's cracked up to be, and pun intended, because it doesn't last very long. It's given us a lot more natural gas. Natural gas has you know, really gone down in price, uh, where some of my contemporaries were wrong, but regardless of who's right and who's wrong, it is something that is going to be short-lived. And I think that if we have any scale up due to the war, a problem in the state of Hormuz, um, someone just up in the price, someone refusing to export, someone uh, putting a sanction on uh, the U.S. Uh, I mean, there's a lot that could go on in this environment where all of a sudden you get a big zoom in the price of oil. Boy, now you've really hurt the bottom line, even though you got a higher you know, price in the gold is your margin what it needs to be to put a robust, uh, you know, 
net profit at the bottom line. Are the electricity prices for miners, say like um, platinum group metal, uh, copper, gold, platinum group metal miners in South Africa, are they reliant on the oil price or are they more reliant on, say, like diesel prices and importing natural gas? Because uh, natural gas imports, you mentioned the U.S. natural gas price. I mean, we have cheap natural gas here in the United States, but a lot of other countries like South America, Asia, Europe, they have to import their liquefied natural gas because a lot of countries have uh, oil and natural gas drilling bans. So they actually have very expensive natural gas. And then that translates to much higher electricity prices. Yeah, that's it. I mean, LNG, liquid natural gas, is uh, it's almost ridiculous. I mean, not that we don't need it. We need energy to run the world. But it's like, are you kidding me? I mean, you think about the process and what goes into it, and somewhat dangerous as well. Uh, it shows you how the true value. I mean, in other words, why would you spend that much for something in a container like that? Well, because you need it. Your industry stops if you don't have it. You can't cook. You can't eat. You can't have a business. Or nuclear so power, yeah. Yeah, but it's, the, the point, the, yeah, in South Africa, they're a mess. I'm still long platinum. It hasn't done anything. I'm still a believer. Uh, it depends on a lot, but most of these platinum mines are not making money. They're losing money at current platinum prices. It's sort of like the silver situation. Most of your primary silver producers are basically at break even, even at $28 silver. They got a slight margin, but not much. And um, and say in platinum's even worse. I mean, most of these miners are mining at a loss. And it's very much a needed metal in in the future. I mean, right now it's needed for you know your cattle converge mostly, but uh there are issues with you know the hydrogen economy, whether that comes to fruition or not. I really don't know. I've studied it enough to know there's a possibility. I'm not betting on that, but if it were to make a breakthrough and uh, the Platinum Guild just put out a paper that I put on my weekly perspective last week, Jason, that talked about the need for uh, it was a uh, 50-fold increase in platinum for the hydrogen economy. That's a piece of paper written down by the Guild, which is biased, but nonetheless, it was food for thought. And especially if electric vehicles don't become popular anymore and the car companies, the auto manufacturers in the future sw switch back to what hybrids. So those will need catalytic converters. I mean, the market kind of discounted thinking that, oh, we're going to switch to electric vehicles. We're going to need more nuclear power, more natural gas, and we're not going to need platinum and palladium for hybrids anymore. But now a lot of these electric vehicle manufacturers are either close to bankruptcy or about to file for bankruptcy. So uh, and then Toyota looks very, very smart for sticking with uh, hybrids. I'm yeah, I'm pretty much anti EV. I mean, I put up a uh, a video on uh, my Twitter account, and I thought Elon might you know ban me or take it down or whatever. Nothing happened. Of course, I'm really not that big on Twitter, but it's a gentleman, probably an engineer and a journalist, very innocently and sincerely asked him, "Well, you know, should we go all electric by 20?" 2030 or 2035, I forget the year, say 2030. And he says, in a word, no. And he goes through, it costs 500,000 tons of material have to be moved with 300 barrels of, en of energy to produce one gallon of energy equivalent battery. Uh, and then he goes on to basically the bottom line is, is there isn't enough, you, you have to increase the mining capability between 400 and 4,000 percent in order to produce enough electric vehicles. And even with that, you would never be able to put the whole world on EVs. Well, you did cannot. you see the did you see the new survey out by people who own electric vehicles for a number of years? And like, I think over over 50 percent, I think 55 percent said they want to switch back because they said the infrastructure, all the issues with waiting in line to charge, how long it takes to charge the lack of infrastructure for the electric vehicles. It's just so bad that it's not worth it. Yeah, that's where the hybrid thing comes in. I think the hybrid's a, a pretty decent idea. Uh, I wouldn't own an EV. I remember my last long road trip, and it's been a while, but you know, driving to Vegas, and honest to goodness, I was thinking, man, I'm so grateful I got this diesel that has a 600 mile range, and you know, it's just chugging along just fine. I would be just if I was driving a Tesla, I would just I don't know, I I just my anxiety level be through the roof, wondering if I could make it or not.
Yeah, I don't think they're they're not good for long trips. Uh, my buddy rented a Tesla for a weekend and we drove around. I mean, it has amazing acceleration of horsepower. So if you're trying to like show off and drive quick in a short distance, but then you're going to burn through the battery, especially if, if you have like air conditioning or heat and the electronics running. So you're not going to get a long distance charge. Yeah, I've driven them. I mean, Mike Maloney's had a few and you know, when he got his last, well, maybe he's got three new ones since I saw him last, but when he was still in LA before he moved to Puerto Rico, he had me drive his new one and it was fun as could be, but you know, practicality, you know, it's too much of my engineering background to look at the long term and what the longevity is and what the efficiencies are. And yeah, I mean, you got electric motor. I mean, shoot, that this can zoom, but how practical are they? Uh, they're not. And oh, it's, oh yeah, I agree. The, the entire supply chain, David, like grocery stores, moving goods, trains, um, you know, once, once the container comes off a ship or off a train, I mean, the, it's moved by diesel because yeah. diesel is reliable, not by electric vehicle. Uh, I want yeah, to ask- so did I answer your question enough? Why don't you add in on your thoughts? Because you're a very smart guy. You look at this stuff too. What do you think about a royalty company at this stage versus, uh, let's say a miner that's looking at like, you know, mining gold at 2000 a year ago and now it's 2500 and think of geez i should get into this gold mining company uh they've got to have a better bottom line without looking at all the details what do you think okay you know i'm biased with the royalty companies that throughout pretty much the entire cycle like even if the metals prices are rising a lot you're going to get the leverage on the royalty companies because then like the juniors are going to get funding for drilling and there might be discoveries there so the royalty companies basically have like free call options on the royalties on the land package uh, I, I like what Franco Nevada has been doing the last 12, 18 months. They're not getting any credit for it right now. I think they're doing, what, uh, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million deals for smart amounts of, of royalties on a near-term production or junior. So they're locking up a lot of future uh, cash flow growth, uh, and they're not getting credit for it now. So I think like that's how you run your business in the long term in different cycles. What They were buying natural gas royalties when they were cheap uh, nine, 10 months ago. So I think they're doing the same with a lot of out-of-favor um, royalty plays. Very good. Yeah, uh, Franco. The Franco stock hasn't moved. I know a lot of people are complaining. Do you think that the main the main reason so far Franco's stock is not rallying much? Do you think it's still Cobra Cobra Panama? The market's still worried that there's no certainty there, and that the uh, management team is getting penalized for that large of a mistake. Yes, it's still my largest holding, so I am biased. But you know, and I bought it at nineteen, so you know, I can hardly complain. But I do think it's being punished more than it deserves. I still think it's probably a stalwart to hold. I'd favor it over all, almost all the gold companies. The problem with, you know, like Newmont and some of these Kinross, some of these companies have done well. Look at Kinross, it's done very well. Um, but, you know, once you get that big, it's really hard to maintain because when you're gobbling up, you know, that many ounces per year to maintain that, you got to find a lot of new, new ore bodies. And there aren't very many. And I mean, stuff that, you know, my geologist friends laughed at. So we used to walk over stuff that was two or three grams. Now they mine it. I mean, you know, as far as I could tell, we've definitely hit peak gold. We may have hit peak silver. I'm yet, I'm not convinced of that one yet. But uh, the more it costs labor-wise, fuel-wise, uh, and all this green movement and the talk about not being able to do open pit mining in Mexico, China catching the gold fever. I mean, there's a lot of factors that are very, very bullish for gold, but you got to be in the right place at the right time. And unfortunately, you know, my bread and butter is the resource sector, not just, you know, gold, silver, and the royalty companies, which is a lot of it. You know, I mean, our uranium stocks are up. Most of our speculations have not done well. I mean, I remember, you know, having the hot hand and I'm some guy just talked about you know, uh, Western copper and I had Western copper. I think we had it like 70 cents and then it changed its name to Western silver. It got a big boost. Then they got Penasquito and it went wild. And then Lambus bought it for like 10 bucks a share. And then gold Corp bought it from them for 30 bucks a share. So that was like a huge, huge win for, you know, the Morgan Report subscribers. But, and I had a few like that way, way back when, but the last decade's been, I've been as horrible as anybody else. But I do it differently on those speculations. I see money you can afford to lose, and I've been that way from the start. Uh, nonetheless, <clears throat> we are in a predicament. We need these materials more than ever. We want to make efficient use of them. 
we're putting them into the most inefficient uses with electric vehicles, windmills, and solar panels. I mean, we really have to kind of take a deep breath, step back, and put a pencil to a piece of paper with somebody that knows what the hell they're doing and make the best use of these minerals that we have left instead of doing the really the exact opposite. Sorry, it sounds all harsh, but again, you know, I mean, when you know something, you know something, but to try to convey it to uh, the political class that convinces the uh, masses through propaganda, it's hard to be a voice in the wilderness and be understood. Oh, yeah, I agree. And what you just highlighted is that the limited supply we have is being wasted on a lot of like ESG green energy projects that the um, that are not super efficient. So they might be good for the politician or the friends who are running a green energy company. So their shares have a quick pump for a year or two or something like that. But long term, they're not going to allow for cheaper electricity in the economy. The other major issue, David, I think this is important piece to the puzzle. Now we're starting to see this the last six to nine months. These elections in Latin America, so like Colombia, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, uh, what Panama decided to do so far with Cobre Panama, unless they reverse it, Peru. Do you think we're going to see very serious supply issues for copper and silver going forward if these countries decide we're either going to stop issuing permits for open pit mining and heat bleaching or um, outright bans? Or delays? One of my many books in my library is... Uh... It's downstairs, but it's called Resource Wars by Adrian Day. And he saw it coming. So did I. He wrote the book, not me. But uh, at some point during this financial survival we talked about earlier, nation states get a financial survival instinct as well. And they wake up at some point and say, you know what? Why should we be selling our silver for dollars for pieces of paper? Uh, maybe we could trade for food or, or you know, whatever. Or oil. Course, <laughs> or oil or whatever, right? So, th yes, that's going to be the, the trend has begun and it will continue and it'll become stronger. And then, you know, someone, the, the big, you know, walk softly and carry a big stick methodology is really going away because it's out in the open. People know about it. I mean, when John Perkins wrote, uh, what's the name of the book? Help me out. Confessions of an Economic uh, Hitman. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that approach is like you do what we say and, and we'll reward you. And if you don't do what we say and we don't reward you, we'll just beat you over the head with a club and do it anyway. Those days are pretty much gone. Uh, so now you have to finesse it. And how do you finesse it? Well, you can't finesse it with more and more money very much longer. I mean, look at the Ukraine. I mean, we ship them hard goods and men, and yet they still need all these you know pieces of paper for what? Where is it going? People are wising up. And nation states are wising up. And it's like, you can't buy me anymore because I don't trust your currency. We're not there yet, but that's the trend. And because that's the trend, these countries will start to hold on to their real assets because they are real money or real value or real wealth. And why would they exchange them for something that's losing value? So we're in a mess. Of course, the bankers know it. They know that this system has to end. It's inevitable. And of course, they want to maintain control. And then Therefore, what do you do? And of course, we've been, you know, talked about with the propaganda machines throughout the political structure, no matter what part of the world you're in, that you're going to be on a new system that's going to be more efficient and you're not going to be penalized as hard with so much uh, big on your transactions. You're going to do it with, you know, just a few pennies and it's going to be instantaneous. It's called the central bank digital currency. And you don't want those other currencies because you need to have it centralized so there's no you know, scammers out there stealing money from it. And, you know, and that, that's a point I'm certainly not in favor of CBDCs. Don't misunderstand. But nonetheless, there has been a lot of uh, grifters in the, in the digital space, unfortunately. So we are where we have always been, where we get to the end of these great inflations, where there's a lot of misunderstanding, mistrust, uh, alternatives that are put up, things that go fast and fall apart, things that look good and you know, FTX us. And all that's kind of par for the course. And as it unravels further and further, it gets to be what do you trust? And it actually comes down to less and less. You start to trust less institutions, less of the political class, less of uh, what used to be trusted, you know, 50 years before. And you start to hunker down into what can you trust and, you know, get out to that Star Wars movie. I think it was about the sixth one where that little guy's flying around in the 
space yard junkyard and he needs to repair the spaceship and he's flying around and he goes for federal credits and waves his hand and this little flying guy says no way man out here we take gold and gold only well i think the other important thing about like the policy shifts here with open pit mining or even the mine accidents that we've had with like victoria gold and ssr mining is that if you buy and hold a gold miner or copper miner or silver miner and you don't understand the assets, you don't pay attention. I mean, you could get caught off guard and then there's a, a new rules change with the government like Mexico. I, I think a lot of those Mexican copper and gold miners, the silver miners, I think they got whacked really, really bad lately with potentially with the open pit ban or at least like the permits are going to be delayed. And then you have another case study, like a, the problem child one is what Argonaut Gold, they went all in because they're a one asset producer. They had to bet the whole company on the one mine and it didn't come in on time and on budget. But the royalty company like Osisco Gold Royalty, which has a, I think they funded the mine and they had a royalty on the project. The shares went down, but they're still around 17. So the royalty company survives a bad deal and the mining company does not. Yeah, well, we've been featuring those from the get go, as you well know. And, uh, you know, those are where I teach people to start and that's, you know, and we have a lot of conservative people. I mean, I keep most of the people that are sophisticated and, you know, they just buy the top tier and even in the top tier, I think I've got seven in there. I just tell them to buy three or four. That's it. Maybe one or two of the mid tiers. If you want to speculate, go ahead, but that's gambling. And uh, it served us well, but some people don't see it that way. And, you know, there's so much of a push to get the best junior company out there uh, that a lot of people buy the list just to know what juniors I like. Well, yeah, I held the hot hand for probably a decade, but I don't have it anymore. I'm just as lousy as the rest of them, unfortunately. I mean, I, uh, I'm going to do an update too for members. I'm going to go through every one of them, which is close to 10, and explain why I'm still holding them. Because, uh, and, and also to be fair, almost every one of them has gone up since we put it on the list. And if you do what I teach and you get a double and you sell it off and, and get a, what's called a free trade, you're not really worried about the price movement. You got it for free. And almost every one of them that's on the list, even though I think well, all except three are down now, uh, all of them, almost all of them had an opportunity to talk to my webmaster because, oh, I got a free ride on every one of them. I go, God, I forgot, you know, because all, all I think about is, you know, all the next issue and I look at what the percentages are and I get up tight because, you know, I'm not doing perfect, but no one can. And then he reminded me that, no, man, every one of those, I don't know if it's everyone, but nearly everyone went up from the time you put it on the list. It's just they got hammered and now they're under, you know, where we recommended them. But anyway, it's it's a tough game. It's very needed. And without the junior industry, you're not going to have a new month. They're not going to go out and spend all this budget and waste money to find a deposit. They'll let some other fool go out and find a deposit, let their stock run from 10 cents to a buck. And then they'll come in and buy it for two bucks and they still got a real value. So that's what, do you think that's what will happen with Barrick Gold? Because the CEO for Barrick Gold, he seems to have done a 180. He said he wasn't going to do any mergers or acquisitions other than maybe a, a copper miner uh, that was over the last year, 12 to 18 months. And then recently, another interview after their Q2 earnings, he said that they're now targeting a new deposit in Canada that they're going to do an acquisition. Yeah, watch if they do not what they say. I know you just told me what he said, but yeah, I, I go with the latter. I mean, there's not much else they can do. And again, you can get too big. I mean, there's a sweet spot for businesses, you know, uh, it really is. Sometimes you can get too big. The payroll's too big. You got too many jurisdictions to worry about. You got foreign currency exchange uh, mechanisms to hedge against. I mean, really, sometimes keeping it at, at the at the sweet spot is better than uh, trying to grow. You can you can grow yourself out of a, out of a profit. Really, I, I I'm not in favor of these huge conglomerates that. Uh, you know, do it. And, you know, in, in fairness, RTZ and BHP probably do it pretty well, but uh, there aren't many that can grow to that size and do it efficiently. Oh, yeah, I agree. Look at the cost for Newmont Mining. So I saw an article saying that like Newmont Mining did a great job keeping the average ore grades the same over the last uh, five to seven years. Well, their costs were around eleven hundred dollars uh, four or five years ago. And now their costs are around uh, sixteen hundred or a little above fifteen hundred as of the Q2 earnings. 
It's just really tough replacing um, reserves and maintaining production when you're that big. I mean, what Newmont's producing, how many million ounces of gold a year? It's an insane number. I don't know what it is. I think it's around five, but I could be wrong. Let me look it up here. It's enormous, enormous amount of copper and gold and silver. So like just to maintain that level of production is very, very tough. Their costs are up a lot. I, I don't see them like they're claiming, David, that they're going to be able to get their costs back down below 1200 by 2028. Based on what I know about the mining industry, cost of capital or grades, all the things you've taught me, I don't think that's possible. Yeah, just I feel good because this is what I remember. 2023, Numa Corporation, the world's largest gold producer, produced 5.4 million ounces. So a 5, point, a 5 million ounce deposit is a rare, rare, rare find. And if you found one and sold it to Newmont, that would equate to one year's worth of production. Well, that's like reserves, right? But I heard Newmont and Barrick don't even look at 5 million ounce deposits. I heard they didn't even want Greenstone because it wasn't 10 million ounces of reserves. So they didn't even weren't even interested. So they, uh, from what I've heard, at least from Rick Roll and others, that they they want minimum ten million ounces of reserves or close to it, and then a, a lot of measured and indicated. So they're not even looking at like efficient deposits that are five million ounces of reserves, like you said, around a thousand dollars or eleven or twelve hundred dollars an ounce cost because it's too small for them. Yeah. Well, it used to be five million, but uh, ten makes sense to me from what you outlined and. Uh... Good luck finding those deposits. Well, there was one. There was Great Bear, right? And then like yep. you had Kinross last year, 18 months ago, something like that. Kinross said, oh, Newmont and Barrick are going to buy this if we wait. So they went in and bought it ahead of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think we're going to see more of that for the mid-tier ones. I don't know if it'll work out on every deal, but I think the mid-tier ones um, overall, I think like the mid-tier ones are the more efficient, like an Alamos Gold, the Lundin Gold. I mean, they're lower cost producers more consistently than, uh, than Barrick. A new month. Yeah. yeah, again, you go back to you know what I said, what's the most efficient size, you know, where are you getting the most value per dollar invested? And then you, you know, you're in that sweet spot. But you know, if you're gonna make a profit for your shareholders and your management team and you get a, you know, you get a high bid, take it, you know, go give it to Newmont, you know. If they're overpaying in a way, then go ahead. You know, you can you have the right to, you know, put it to the shareholders, let them vote. If they want to overpay, go ahead. Do you think going forward that the royalty and streaming companies, so like the senior ones and the midter ones, they have superb growth opportunities with a demand for copper and how a lot of these banks do not want to fund the entire amount of like a copper deposit that's billions of dollars. So there's a lot of opportunity there for growth. Uh, there is. I'm not as big on copper as some. I mean, I've got a copper project in Montana I really like. I'm going to go visit it later in the summer here, early fall. Um, but I'm, you know, not Friedland. I, I'm not as bullish as he is. I, I think the global economy is contracting, not expanding. And I think a lot of this electric everything, green everything is not true. And so I have a little more conservative outlook on the copper situation from a macro perspective than most. Uh, I still like certain deals. This one in Montana is just too sweet uh, because you're always going, well, in a perfect capitalistic world, which doesn't exist, but you're still going to look at what your best ratio is for money invested and, and jurisdiction, uh, safety, you know, you're going to, you know, is everybody going to run to Mexico to explore now? No, I don't think so. So anyway, having said all that, I like it, but not as well as I like silver and gold. I think the money metals are actually going to be the place to be overall. And copper will probably be fourth place after uranium. I, I think some of the copper demand uh, picture is uh, not accurate, like you said, like green energy and some electric vehicles and uh, housing in China, because there's an overbuild there. But I think it's uh, the estimates are under estimating like the amount of copper required for like the next generation data centers, because like all the large tech companies, they're spending like crazy. They have all these plans to build like these next generation data centers for artificial intelligence so they don't have to add as many overpriced human employees to do a lot of the work. So the CapEx spending, David, like I live right outside of Washington, D.C., the land grab here by like Amazon and Meta and Microsoft and Google, it's absolutely insane for them to buy land packages and uh, 
they're planning, they haven't started building a lot of the data centers yet, but they're buying the land right now. And then they're planning over the next like couple of years to start building these like order of magnitude larger data centers that require insane amounts of electricity. So I think that's a growth engine. I, I think, you know, the, the, the tech companies, they have profits and they're large and there might even be government programs. So I think that's going to be kind of recession proof compared to some of the other um, demand for copper. Yeah, I agree with you. So in terms of uh, value right now in the gold and silver sector, you think people should avoid a lot of juniors right now? Or do you think that juniors at these uh, gold prices, they're going to start to get, what, 20 million bucks for funding? And you think we're going to see some discoveries and some uh, juniors that start to outperform? I think if you know what you're doing, there's definitely opportunities. I mean, I've seen a few companies that are rare that have had drill results that in the past would have probably doubled the stock price, like literally within a few days or within a week, and they just do nothing. And that's very disheartening, but it shows you how beat up the industry really is. Uh, not many people know how to read drill results. Not that I'm an expert, but I've been at it for four decades or more. And uh, there's always opportunity. There isn't a lot. And the other thing is, uh, you know, as we keep talking, where is it? I mean, uh, you know, if it's in Mexico, you're going to think twice about it. I'll give you a real quick story. I don't think I've told it on your show. I've only said this thing maybe twice in, in all my in days of podcasting. But I was on one of my early trips back in the beginning, and I'm in Mexico. And I really like this project. It, you know, people were good. They had infrastructure. I mean, everything just seemed like... God, this is, I'm going to, you know, I like this speculation. Getting back on the bus, we're going back to the hotel, and one of the older guys, analysts, started talking to me and asked me what I thought. And I told him, I like it. And he said, well, you got to realize it's right next to one of the biggest marijuana crops in Mexico. Oh, and the cartel the, was right the there? The cartel is right next to it. You don't want anything to do with it. And I thanked him on the spot, but I'll never forget that. Because there's something like that that you might overlook, even though you're physically on the ground, right? But I didn't really think about the cartels. I just didn't think that way at that time. And so that was a very big lesson learned. For me. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, there are stories like that over the last like five to 10 years that like a mine was built and then all of a sudden a cartel took over like a local town or something like that. And like they wanted to be paid like protection money. I mean, I've heard those stories off and on over the years with some of the smaller producers in Mexico. Yep, it's true. So it just shows you that um, if you bet on a mining company, on a producer, you have to understand geopolitics, you have to pay more attention. And that's not even counting like all the difficulties of actually running the mine where, oh, no, the electricity prices went up. Oh, no, the, the newest one. Oh, there's a labor strike in somewhere in Chile, right? Or Argentina that they want to um, demand higher wages because the local currency has been debased and the mining union wants a, a wage boost when the commodity prices are falling. That's it. Yep. So the the individual mining stocks, I guess, like it's really difficult to buy and hold a lot of these things unless you buy them really cheap. Like, let's say like a uranium company, Cameco from 2020, 2022. I mean, the shares were, I think, between eight and fifteen dollars for for a number of years. So they were super cheap back then. It was a good risk and reward speculation. But a, a lot of these gold miners, so many things can go wrong trying to run the mine, especially with the silver miners. Like you said, uh, what what price do we need? for uh, profits for these silver miners. If you're seeing it's break even now at the current price around $28, $29, what did they need? $35, $40 an ounce silver? Yeah, the, there's a uh, paper, a white paper in my, you know, <clears throat> on the members of the premium side, the paid version. It's called uh, Archie's Rule. It's a dissertation between me and Dr. McGaw before he retired years ago. And it's a, uh, shows an asymptotic curve Basically, you need a 2x. So if you're all in sustaining costs, taxes included, everything, no fudging the numbers, is 25 bucks an ounce, you need $50 silver. And that's a fact, Jack, and it doesn't sound right, but it is. He's proved it. It's available for all of my readers. Um, it was a real lesson learned. Dr. McGaw was very um, generous with me with his time. He was always patient with me and they taught me a lot, not just on the geology side, but also on the economic side. And is, uh, is that the former uh, geologist and CEO of Mag Silver? That's him. Okay, I want to make sure for our listeners out there because you mentioned the name, and our listeners might not be familiar. Right. Sorry. Well, thanks for bringing that to everyone's attention. Yeah. 
So yeah, Mag's a, Mag's like arguably the top uh, silver project in the world, like in terms of like reserves and grade. And I think even their grade has started to fall recently, but it's a low cost project. Yeah, it is. I own it. And I love it. And I've had it for a long time and I'm probably going to hold it for a lot longer. But so it's based sad, you know, with Mexico being so prolific in silver, but I'm, you know, I don't lean either direction. I mean, I'm, I try to be apolitical. I just don't. Like well, well, isn't isn't overall annual silver production and copper production in Mexico and and uh, Chile and Peru some of the main producers? Like, it's in permanent decline. I think for some of the main silver and copper producing countries, like their annual supply for those two metals for copper and silver is in permanent decline. I think. Well, I don't know, permanent, but you're right. I mean, the trend is there. And, uh, you know, look at Fresno. I mean, the grades keep going down and down and down on an average basis, which means, you know, the mines are being depleted. Uh, you know, and I mean, the high grade silver days are gone. I told you about what the grades in gold are like. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not anti gold. I don't consider myself a gold bug, although most people that listen to me on interviews like this consider that I am. I don't care what you call me. The point is, if you got a really, really restrictive use of capital for what's needed to for everybody on the planet to eat and be able to drive, you'd probably quit mining gold, but you'd still mine silver. You couldn't do anything without silver. So there's there's a trade off here between the cost to mine gold and the cost to mine silver, and you know it's very expensive to mine gold. You know, as you said, like sixteen hundred dollars an ounce. Or to mine silver, are you looking at twenty eight dollars? And a lot, a lot of gold and silver are byproducts, right? Of like copper mines or lead and zinc mines. That's the the majority of the supply is byproduct, right? Seventy percent. That's correct. Yep. So if we have a recession, if you're right, and the copper prices fall, that's going to also restrict supply then for uh, platinum group metals and gold and silver as well. Yeah, it's hard times ahead. I'm afraid. Um, it's just inevitable, you know, I mean, we overshoot, you know, I mean, you look at uh, any function in life, I mean, it tends to go from, you know, or look at a stock or you know, a commodity, undervalued, fair valued and overvalued. We're overvalued in the stock market. We're overvalued in, you know, what we've produced um, for several years. And now that super abundance is waning and it's cost more to get it and the oil prices higher than it was and the labor costs are greater than they were and there's pressure on wages and there's discontent in the populations and there's angst about you know the war efforts and people feel like their voice isn't being heard and you've got a divide in the country like we haven't had in a very long time and so all these things are ripe for more and more of that trend to continue rather than to get you know kumbayas here everybody's wrapping their arms around each other and saying, geez, we're in the greatest country that ever lived. Those days are behind us. Yeah, well, the, both political parties are making tons and tons of mistakes. And whoever is controlling Congress or the White House, David, I, I think we're just going to see more currency debasement. They're really just disagreeing over where to spend all the money that's uh, currency, excuse me, that's created out of thin air um, or stolen through taxes. So um, they're just fighting over where to where to spend the money or where uh, who gets to steal it at this point. Um, neither party uh, seems interested at all in cutting back. I totally agree. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. I, I recommend my listeners, if you want to learn about Austrian School Economics and a lot of the supply-demand picture for silver, David and Chris Marchese wrote the Silver Manifesto. I don't think it's a uh, hardcover uh, is available according to you. Yeah, let me, let me interrupt you there um, because... It looks like one of the best known uh, gold and silver dealers in the country. I won't name them because uh, they don't want to. It's going to buy, it's going to run at 500 copies, which sounds like nothing. I mean, 500 is a big number, but there's so little interest in uh, in this sector right now. But he's probably going to go ahead and print off 500 copies. So if that happens, I'll definitely have it up on the website for everybody that wants a hard copy. Well, there's little interest in gold and silver bullion right now at the retail level in the U.S. Because like um, Amark is publicly traded with their the wholesaler, and I think their sales are down enormously. But it's the exact opposite, as we highlighted earlier in the interview, for investment demand in the Asian countries. I mean, demand is at record levels in a lot of these countries. There was just an article, I think, about like 
Thailand and Vietnam, like their pension funds, institutional investors are starting to buy gold tonnage. Retail investor demand is at record levels in those places. So it's basically the metals going from uh, west to east.